Oh, hi. Thanks for inviting me. It's a delight to be with you today, albeit, uh, albeit virtually. Today, we're going to talk about finding your inner fish. What we're going to do is look at the evolution of our bodies. We're going to look at how we learn about the history of life on our planet. And we look to see how when we look at the history of life on our planet, what we find are certain real surprises buried inside of us. Now, these insights came to me when I was teaching human anatomy at the medical school of the University of Chicago. I arrived at the University of Chicago in about the year 2000, and one of my big teaching assignments was to lead the first year anatomy course that we teach for future physicians. And this is a very famous course in, across the medical curriculum around the world. This is where our students see the human body in cadaverous form for the first time, where we dissect the human body and learn thousands of new names um, and new structures and so forth. But it can also be very stressful on our students. And so uh, is what I would do is I would hang out with our, med our medical students, you know, around the dissecting tables each week and to let them get to know me and I would get to know them. And almost invariably, those students would ask, they'd ask, Dr. Shubin, what kind of doctor are you? Are you a, you know, a heart surgeon? Are you a neurosurgeon? And I'd say, well, I'm a, I'm a fish paleontologist. And they'd be like, what? <laughs> I want my money back. <laughs> but it soon became clear that being a paleontologist and not just any paleontologist, a fish paleontologist is a powerful way to learn and teach human anatomy. And the reason for that is many of the best roadmaps for our own bodies are seen in other creatures. Some of the best roadmaps to the complex tangle of nerves inside our heads are seen in sharks and fish. Some of the best roadmaps to the basic organization of our brain are seen in reptiles. And the reason for this is because of evolution. The reason for this is because in every organ, every tissue, every cell, in every piece of DNA in our bodies, we contain artifacts of billions of years of the history of life. And how do we know that? We know that because we can go out and find fossils that show our connection to the rest of life on our planet. We know that when we look at embryos and look at the embryos of different creatures to see how they develop. And we also know when we look at DNA of living creatures. So it's really amazing. Now, there's another part of this story, one I want to talk about, one that's actually shown in this slide, is that we can go out and find fossils that tell us about these great transitions in the history of life. And I want to give you a sense of how we find these fossils, what they tell us about our bodies, and then expand it from there. So when I was a, when I was a student uh, looking for a PhD thesis, I... Um, was actually confused or unsure about what I was going to work on. And so I uh, took a seminar led by a professor in my, my university on like the history of life. And each week we'd study a different great transition in the history of life. And so I remember um, seeing this slide, this exact slide. Uh, when I was a student in the mid late 1980s, you can see the date on the, the bottom corner there, um, uh, that showed what we knew about at the time of the transition from fish to land living animal. And so what you see on top is a fish, a cartoon of a fish. This is a cartoon of a fossil fish that's known from rocks about 390 million years old. And you look, it looks like a fish, right? But look at the creature on the bottom. The creature on the bottom is a cartoon of a fossil of one of the earliest creatures to walk on land. This is a, a fossil that's found in rocks about 365 million years old. And it's one of the first creatures to walk on land. And look at it. It has limbs with fingers and toes. It has a head. It has a neck. So I remember looking at this diagram and thinking, that's a wonderful scientific problem to study. How did fish evolve to walk on land? Because when you look at it, it seems so utterly impossible. How did fins transform into limbs? How did the head change? How did all these structures happen? So what I decided to do, I was training to be a paleontologist at the time, uh, since we've sort of moved into molecular biology as well. But at the time I was like thinking about, you know, how do you go about finding fossils? Like how would we find an intermediate here? You know, how do you find like a flat headed fish with fins, with arm bones on side, something that mixes these two, you know, kinds of creatures. And so remember the creature on tops from rocks about 390 million years old, the creature on the bottoms from rocks about 365 million years old. 
So I wanted to be in that window of time. So what you do is, if you're looking for new places to find fossils, what you do is you look for places in the world that have three things. First is you look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age to hold the fossils that you're working on. All right, remember I told you, as I said, critter on top from rocks about 390 million years old, critter on the bottom from rocks about 365 million years old. You want to be in that window of time between 390 and 365 million years old. And that's a time period called the middle to late Devonian. Okay, first, you want to look for Devonian age rocks, that window of time. The next is you want places in the world that have rocks of the right type to hold the fossils, right? Not every kind of rock holds fossils, right? Igneous rocks formed in lava. Yeah, they're going to burn everything up. Metamorphic rocks that are highly pressurized and things like that or heated up. They're not going to hold fossils typically. What you want are rocks that are formed in the right environments to hold fossils. In this case, rocks formed in ancient rivers and streams, maybe oceans in the near shore. Um, sedimentary rocks, rocks that are sandstones, siltstones, shales. Okay, so rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type. Now it does me no good if my wonderful rocks of the right age and the right type are buried 12 miles underground, right? And they have to be exposed to the surface. So now you have it, that's how we do it. Look for rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type, and rocks that are exposed at the surface so we can work on them. That's kind of what you do. And that's what I set off to do. So when I took my first um, academic job, let me move myself here. When I took my first academic job, get out of your way. Um, I was um, actually a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in the Southeast corner of the state of Pennsylvania in the United States. And I was a young professor and I didn't really have a whole lot of, um, you know, opportunity to lead global expeditions that came later. So what I did is I wanted to think about what's local what kind of can I do like nearby my house in, Pen in, in Philadelphia, which is in the southeastern corner of the state. So I dug out, of, here's a map of Pennsylvania. I went to the Geological Survey of Pennsylvania to find out what they knew. And I discovered this, looking purple here, across the state of Pennsylvania in the US, in purple here, what you can see is Devonian age rocks, right? Remember, rocks are the right age. They're all over the state of Pennsylvania, about three hour drive on roads from my house in, in Philadelphia. Wow, that was good. The other thing that got even better is the kinds of rocks of Devonian age were perfect to hold these fossils. If you wanna think about it, what Pennsylvania looked like 365 million years ago, like when these rocks were being formed, it didn't have cities or forests. It looked like what the Amazon Delta looks like today. This is a, what you're gonna see now is a reconstruction of what the state of Pennsylvania looked like 365 million years ago. Boom, that's it. What you have is like the Amazon Delta. To the east of Pennsylvania, you had a highlands, right? Mountains and things like that. To the west of Pennsylvania, right out here, you had what's a sea known as the Catskill Sea shown in blue. Okay, and between them, you had a series of rivers that extend from east to west. Okay, that's what's going down here. You had the um, ancient delta system. So this is perfect. If you want to find, you know, creatures that the, you know, right at the transition from life in water to life on land, you have the environments right here. You have rocks that were formed in ancient seas near the shore. You had rocks that were formed in ancient estuaries, in rivers and ponds. We had it all, right? Rocks are right age, rocks that reflected the right environments the hist hist historical environment. And finally, you know, you had, we had the rocks accessible, but the access wasn't great because remember, you know, when, if you're thinking about what, where rocks are likely to be at the surface, uh, they may be at the surface here, but a lot of that state is covered with forests. So what happened is the research program became looking for places in the state of Pennsylvania where roads were being built in ancient, you know, where there was Devonian rock. So when what happened is they were building, a, if they were building a road, where there was Devonian rock, they'd cut into the, you know, into the rock, bring it to the surface, right? They dynamite it to make a road cut or what have you. And they produced places like this. And what you see is a road cut in the central part of Pennsylvania. Okay, it's an hour north of one of the great universities in, in Pennsylvania. And along this road, the Department of Transportation, when they went to widen it, they dynamited rock and they exposed here in red, um, ancient Devonian age rocks.
Now, what we have here in this road on the side here, this road cut, this cliff along the margin of the road, what you have are layer after layer of rocks of the right age, Devonian age. Furthermore, these rocks, if you were to look really closely at them, were formed in ancient rivers and streams. Perfect. Rocks of the right age, Devonian. Rocks of the right type formed in ancient, formed in ancient rivers and streams. Boom. Now, what you can see is if you look in the far end of that, look and see the cars all the way out there. You can see our station wagons. And if you look really carefully all the way at the end of this slide, you'll see uh, something in red and yellow. That's a human being working on an area where we're finding lots of bones. We started to find bones immediately. The first thing we started to find were teeth the size of like a railroad spike, a giant, you know, spike. Teeth is you know, the, the width of your hand. Then we started to find the jaws of these creatures. The jaws were the length of an arm, a human arm. And this is one of my, my colleagues holding the front end of one of these jaws. That's just the front end, massive. The whole creature is about 15 feet long with teeth the size of, you know, twice the size of your thumb. Okay, big time. Then we started to find all kinds of little creatures that had armor around them. This is a squashed creature. Um, you could see its skull on the right, just squashed. You could see its body on the left. Um, then the team found working in these rocks, um, started to find arm bones, shoulders, hip bones, legs, skulls of some of the first creatures to walk on land. So here you see this bone here is a humerus an upper arm bone, really it's your upper arm. Uh, and it's very similar to, you know, a, a, an early limbed vertebrate, like the one I showed you before in the early one. So we worked with um, the National Geographic Society to reconstruct what that ancient road cut in Pennsylvania looked like. So if you want to know what those rocks, the world inside those rocks was, this is what it looked like. You had some of the earliest forests with trees you see here. You see that 15 foot long critter in the center here, right there, right, right above me. Um, that would have been bad. You wouldn't want to swim with that in the water. <laughs> you know, it had huge teeth. And then you find all around, you have lots of other creatures, including, if you look really carefully, some creatures with fingers and toes, some of the creatures, some of the earliest creatures to walk on land. So really amazing, right? But we realized we had a problem. And the problem was this. We were already finding creatures that were walking on land. We were in rocks too young. These rocks are about 365 million years old. We needed rocks about, you know, 300, a little bit older, 375 million years old. So back to the drawing board. So what we needed to do was sort of captured on this slide here. Remember this diagram, right? You have the fish on top, limbed animal on the bottom. Let's just look to see what some of the differences are, right? Look at the skull of the critter on top, the fish on top. It's a lobe finned fish, and it's a fish that has a head shaped like a cone with eyes on either side. What is the shape of the head of the early limbed animal on the bottom? It's flat. So what we have is, in this transition, a change in the structure of the skull from something shaped like a cone with eyes on either side to, in a limbed animal, a flat head with, with, with eyes on top, okay? The next thing is, look at the fish on top. Does it have a neck? No, the fish on top has a head that's connected to the shoulder. It can't, it can't move its head independently of the body. The limbed animal on the bottom, like us, has a neck where the head can swivel around separately from the body, okay? And there are lots of features here. Just one important one is, you know, fish have fins and creatures that walk on land have limbs with fingers and toes and wrists and ankles, okay? So what we wanted are, is a creature that has intermediate, right? That has, you know, that has maybe a flat head with, um, with a fin with arm bones inside, something right in the middle. Turns out what we needed to do was to go to a part of the world, to find a part of the world, I should say, that had rocks that were slightly older than our rocks in Pennsylvania, known as Catskill rocks, and they needed to be about 10 to 15 million years old, right? So rocks the right type, keep them formed in deltas, but in this time, rocks the right age means moving about 10 to 15 million years earlier to a time period called the Franian of the late Devonian. So we had lots of ideas of where to work, but it turns out that a college geology textbook really showed us the places we wanted to be. We found this diagram, and this diagram was found in a college geology textbook. And what you see is a map of North America. You see the United States in the center. You see Canada to the north, Mexico to the south. Superimposed on top of that is a, ma a map of where the rocks 
um, of Devonian age, of the Red Age, of, of how, how they were formed. And these authors identified three regions shown in red um, that were formed in ancient Delta systems. So look at the bottom right. One area they identified is in the eastern part of North America. That's in the United States. That's, um, that was where we were working. That's the Catskill, form, Catskill area. We've been there. We've done that. We know that. Look at the top right. What you have there is also an area red. Those were rocks formed in ancient deltas uh, in East Greenland. And that's where uh, some of the earliest limbed animals had come from by teams run by the Swedish, uh, Swedish teams in the 20s and 30s. You see where I'm going? Extending 1,500 kilometers east to west across the Canadian Arctic and the Arctic Islands is unexplored rock of the right age called Franian age and in a, in, a, in a formation called the Fromm Formation. So there you have it. That led us to, to that. So we were so excited uh, about this. The, um, and then we dug out some papers by this gentleman here. Uh, and we pulled out a paper that showed kind of exactly for us where us were to work. And this was the scientific paper that led us there. Um, there was a whole thing in the scientific paper um, that, uh, that, you know, this, is a, this single page told us where to look. It basically said, and I'll translate this just very gently, it says, when he talked about the age of the rocks in the Arctic, he said in bold here, the available data indicate an age of early to middle Franian. Basically, this means these are rocks of the exact right age. Finally, when they talked about where to, um, where to look, he talked about these rocks. He said, the Fromm Formation, that is these rocks in the uh, Canadian Arctic, is similar to the rocks in Pennsylvania. So here we had rocks that were similar to those we were working in the state of Pennsylvania, only they were a little bit older. This is perfect. Remember, rocks the right age, rocks the right type. We had both things right here. OK, uh, let's skip that. Um, so this is a map of the of the area. What you see um, in the upper left is the Canadian Arctic. You can see you're looking at this from like the North Pole. And circled in red in the upper left um, is what's called Nunavut Territory of Canada, right? So it's the northernmost territory of Canada. Look in the main section of the slide. Here you see it extending all the way across those islands there circled in red are where these rocks are at the surface. It's pretty amazing. And look at the scale, you know, a uh, hundred kilometers. It's a lot of rock to look at. This is the right rock. This is the place. This is what we decided to look at. Okay, so now we had a new problem. Instead of driving from my home in one part of Pennsylvania to another part of the state of Pennsylvania, now we're working, working near the North Pole. <laughs> and there's a lot going on near the North Pole, right? It's in the winter, it's, it's dark for 24 hours a day. In the summer, it's daylight for 24 hours a day. It's very, very remote. It's very cold at all times of the year. And there are polar bears up there and polar bears are known to um, be trouble for people if you run across one. So to give you a sense of how remote this is, the nearest village to our, um, our what turned out to be our fossil site uh, is, a, is, a, is a village called a town called Greece Fjord, Canada. And it's about 300 miles from us. And this is a picture of that town uh, in spring. Right, so you were very, very far from you know the nearest cities or anything like that, and so we have to bring all our food in. We have to fly in. So what we do is to get in. What we do is we take. You can see the airplane there. Those airplanes are very special. They have big tires and they can land right on the tundra. They don't need a, a an airstrip. Um, and then, but we're, um, but we, but their our camps do not have access to airplanes. So we need helicopters to get in there. So the planes bring in crew and food. Uh, food and fuel, and then the helicopters shuttle us to camp. We're beyond the tank of petrol for a um, for a helicopter, so we got to bring all the few food in and fuel in. It's 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 it, there's a lot of lot of work planning to make this happen. To give you a sense, is we only take a lot few not a lot of people. We take a very small crew. We don't bring a lot of stuff because we're so reliant, so dependent on aircraft. Uh, that this is what we bring. We don't bring a whole lot of people. All our food goes in those white tubs. Uh, we're there for about six weeks uh, in the um, Arctic summer. So that's what it is. So we started these expeditions in the year 1999. And this is kind of where we uh, where we started in the western part of the Arctic. You can see the arrow in the inset on the map in the upper right. 
Look in the center of the diagram, you can see our camp. This is kind of what camp looks like. This is my where I live in the summers. Um, oh, what's beautiful here is you can drink the water right out of the streams um, because it's so pure right out of the glaciers, it's great. And we each live in those our own little mountaineering tent and then have a kitchen tent. And then you can see in the distance here, these are the Devonian rocks, right? They don't look very impressive. They're very low lying, um, but they hold fossils. We were able to find fossil sharks and other things like that. But it turns out we were in the wrong part of the Arctic here. We were in the middle of an ancient ocean. And while we were rocks the right age, these rocks in the middle of the ocean, you're not gonna have the earliest creatures to walk on land in the middle of the ocean. So we realized we were in the wrong part. So that first season was kind of a, not a success, but it taught us how to work there. And so we went back, uh, you know, so we were in an ancient ocean shown in blue here. We needed to go upstream into the ancient streams. So we did that, so uh, in the rocks. Um, and what you have here is shown, shown in the upper right. <clears throat> you can see the arrow we moved to the east now. Uh, this is in the year 2000. This is our second year looking for these. You could see our camp here. Look across the water there. Look across the ice and the water. You see those cliffs in the distance? Those are Devonian age rocks of the right age. And these now weren't formed in oceans. They were formed in ancient rivers and streams. So now we're in the right place. Well, as soon as we hit those kinds of rocks, we started to find fossil fish. And we started to find fossil fish, much like the lobe fin fish I showed you before, but they were bits and pieces. They were not, they were not great. We were coming to the right kinds of fish, but they were not the best. They were not preserved well. We'd find like an isolated jaw or individual teeth, not a whole skeleton. So we needed something else. We needed something a little bit better. So what we did is we eventually found this valley here, this area. And what you have is, what you're seeing here is the fossil site that was discovered. It was actually discovered by a student who joined us on these expeditions, a college student who was very eager. He really wanted to be a paleontologist and it turns out he made a huge discovery. So what you see on the left is, this is a spot. See, it's, see the rocks there below us, below my head here, like right there, those rocks. Um, those rocks there are, so you see they're brown and red, a little bit green. It turns out they're covered with fish fossils, all fragments of them. And so you could see us on the upper right, the student discovered them. After the student discovered them, we crawled those areas, picking up all the fossil bones. And we eventually were looking for a layer where those fossils were coming from. And you can see on the bottom right, that's where the, um, right there on the bottom right, um, you could see the, the bits and pieces that we found. We eventually found the layer, and this is the layer here. Uh, we exposed it, it was a whole layer, and you can see how the layer uh, was exposed. Uh, and we found that that layer contained hundreds of fossil fish piled one on top of the other, whole skeletons. So this is exactly it. So we worked this quite a bit. And this is what the area looked like. You can see in the center, there's like a big hole. And that's where we, oh, that's the layer we opened up. And this is the area of the Arctic that we, that we worked on. So what we did is we worked this layer for about a year, <clears throat> actually two, two summers, I should say. And then uh, looked inside there, removing rocks. And everything changed when my colleague here, and shown in blue, this is um, one of my colleagues, removed a rock. And this is the first site we had of the major fossil discovery. What you see in the front, I hope you can see it, you may not be able to, is that there's something that looks like a fossil in the front. You probably are not seeing it. I'll give you a second. Can you see a fossil in this? I'll point it out to you in a second. Just spend a second looking. Is there something? It's going to be the same color as the rock but it's gonna have a different shape. Ready? There, boom. See in the front end there, there's something that looks like it's a jaw, a long rod. And another thing next to it looks like a long jaw, different shape to the rock around it. In fact, it was clearly bone. And as soon as I saw that, I knew we had found what we were looking for. So we etched this thing out of the rock and brought it home to the lab to prepare. And then since we found like 20 more of these things and you'll, you'll I'll show you the first one, this because it's kind of a fun one. Brought it home to the lab, comes back in the home based in the back of a helicopter or below a helicopter, I should say. Then you remove the rock grain by grain. Look what starts to open up. You could start to see that there's a head, the top of a head, and it looks like there are eye holes. A few more months go by, look at this. It has a flat head with eyes on top. There's even a shoulder. It looks like it might have a neck. So remember, we were looking for you know something intermediate between a fossil fish and an early limbed animal. We were looking for a flat-headed fish, maybe with arm bones inside, and this is the specimen. It's about oh, it's about a meter and a half long, 
look at it. It has a flat head with eyes on top, uh, like an early limbed animal, but it looks like a fish. Look, it's got scales on its back. And even if you look on the right here, in the, in the background there, there's a fin with fin webbing. But look, it has a neck as well. So it's a mixture of characters. And when we opened up the fin, guess what we found? Bones that correspond to the upper arm, forearm, even parts of a wrist and fingers inside the fin, right? This is a transitional creature. So what we have here is a creature that's right at the transition between life in water and life on land. That is like a fish, it has fins and scales, a primitive jaw and lots of other things. But like a land living animal, it has a neck, wrists, arms, legs inside the fins. And if you look at this, um, oh, let me go back. If you look at it, if you look at the fin and we open it up and we could see the joints inside the fin, it has a shoulder shown in A. It has an elbow shown in B and a wrist joint shown in C and D. So this is a fin with elbows, wrists, digits and so forth. And that you can see one of the graduate students, Justin Lemberg, who worked on that in my lab. So what do you have here? You have a fish, which I didn't tell you has lungs and gills. It has a neck, it has arm bones, but it's a fish. It has scales and fins and gills as well. So it's a mixture of life and water and life on land. And you can ask, you can ask the question, you can say, um, so what does this tell us about ourselves? And what I'm gonna say is if we look at the fossils, if we look at embryos and we look at DNA, what we find is the neck we see for the first time in this creature, the wrist we see for the first time in this creature in the distant past is something that's become our own wrist, something that's to become our own neck. So every time you shake your head, every time you bend your wrist, you can thank these creatures living in ancient Devonian streams because evolving to walk on land, which is pretty amazing stuff. And how do we know this? Well, we know this because we can trace the bones from fish to amphibians to reptiles to people. I can trace the upper arm bone, the elbow, and even parts of the wrist all the way from these fish to people using the fossil evidence. But I can do that with DNA, with living creatures. I can do it with the embryos of living creatures as well. It's a really remarkable story when we look at all this. So what does it mean? You're looking at Arbel Einstein. You know, somebody who's done, had the pinnacle of human achievement. When I look at this, I look at Einstein, I look at that body and I say, you know what? I just see a big fat old fish. And if you compare Professor Einstein to the fish, all right, Einstein's on the left over here, right? <laughs> so let's compare it. Look, we could find arm bones and fish like we showed you before, but let's look at the embryos. If you look at Einstein or you or me as an embryo, that's a human embryo on top, what you have is a, a few weeks after conception, so a few weeks after the embryo is conceived, let it develop a bit, what you have are a series of pouches uh, in the, what, the future, what's called pharyngeal area. And you can see they're color coded, light blue, dark blue, green, and yellow. There are cells inside those. Guess what? You want to look at a shark head or a fish head? They're not identical, but they have the same thing. <clears throat> now you could trace where those cells go in the in, you know, as they develop. And what you'll find is like in a shark, the cells in that first swelling become the upper and lower jaws of a shark, right? You can see the shark embryo on the left, an adult shark on the right. But if you look at the other ones, they all become parts of the gill apparatus, the gills, you know, the and the you know, and all that, all that, the, the, the things that support the gills. What happens in people? Well, we have these swellings too, right? The first one becomes part of our lower jaw and two bones in our ear. The second one becomes a throat bone and one bone in our ear. And the others become parts of the voice box, as well as the muscles and nerves and, and arteries that supply all this. What does this mean? This means that many of the muscles and nerves and bones I'm using to talk to you right now are similar and the many of the muscles and nerves and bones you're using to hear me with right now correspond to gill structures in sharks and fish. And we know this because we can compare the embryos, we can compare the DNA that makes all this stuff, and we can look at the fossils to show how they transformed from one to another, how a gill bone, for instance, became an ear bone. Strange, but true. That's to show you the history that's inside of us. The history inside of us really relates much of it to this. What do you see here? You see a fertilized egg. We all began 
is a single cell fertilized egg with all that DNA inside and lots of proteins that we got from our mother. As you go from development, as you go from a single cell to an adult with trillions and trillions of cells, so you go from left to right, right? Um, what happens? Development. We grow. The cell, one cell becomes two cells, becomes four cells, becomes eight cells, becomes 16 cells, and on and on and on and on until you get that, right? On the, on the, all the way there on the right. That's amazing because what happens is you have lots of DNA being turned on and off. And that DNA has a recipe inside it that builds bodies. Guess what? The recipe, the DNA recipe that builds our bodies from egg to adult is similar to fish. It's even similar to fry, uh, flies. Look at this. Let's take a human body. We have a backbone, right? Vertebral column. And it's, you could color coded here, you know, different regions of the vertebral column. And there are genes active when we were embryos. This is a, an embryo here. There are genes being turned on and off to make our backbone as well as other structures in our bodies. I'm just taking the backbone now. <clears throat> if you look at these genes, guess what? Versions of these same genes are found in the embryos of flies doing what? Making the body of flies. The basic toolkit that builds our bodies is seen in flies, fish, worms, and other creatures. So we can use fossils to show us how we're connected to other creatures. We can lead expeditions around the world. We can look at the DNA that builds our bodies and to see how versions of it are building other creatures as well. We're seeing the beauty of the history uh, of life. And you can ask the question, you can say, well, what does it mean to have all this, these similarities to fish and flies and worms? And I could say, well, it matters a lot to the Nobel Prize Committee who awards basic prizes in, um, in medicine and physiology. Because look at the Nobel Prizes in medicine and physiology over the last 40 years. Who have they gone to? They've gone to people working on mice. They've gone to people working on flies. In fact, two Nobel Prizes or to five people in the last 15 years have gone to folks working on a tiny little worm the size of a comma on a piece of paper. But that little worm is telling us how our cells uh, are programmed to die and how our genes are programmed to be turned off and what happens in diseases like human cancers. So I'd like to think that as we discover cures to everything that ails us from Alzheimer's disease to different cancers, that the breakthroughs that will extend and enrich our lives will in some way be based on flies, worms, and in some cases, even fish. I can't imagine a more powerful or more beautiful statement for the evolutionary history of our species than that. Thank you very much.